Greetings, dear saint, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to part two of a series entitled Repent and Be Baptized. And in the first installment, we talked about water baptism. And we're going to be talking about the different kinds of baptisms that the Bible talks about. They're quite a number. And today we're going to be talking about the baptism into the death of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to read from the book of Romans chapter 5, verse 18, all the way through to Romans chapter 6, verse 18. Paul writes and says, Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man many will be made righteous. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin, because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey them as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Praise God for his wonderful and precious word. And the Apostle Paul there is talking about the new life that we live as believers and transformation through a revelation of who we are in Christ Jesus and the true nature of the gospel and the true nature of grace. But before we get deeper into this message, I just want to give a brief recap because we are building on from one message to the next. And last time we talked about the meaning of the term baptism, because this term is applied, like I said, in different ways in the Bible, but it's a necessary part of every believer. And we talked about how the word baptizo talks about a total immersion. And I gave the example of how it was a term used when people dyed cloth, uh, for instance, white cloth into purple cloth, and it was totally immersed in the dye. And then when it was taken out, it was said to have been baptized. And it's a total, complete uh, unmistakable immersion. Uh, baptism, again, we also talked about, has the element of transformation. That is, immersion to the point of, or for the purpose of transformation. Just like that purple cloth, for instance, which was immersed and then it came out changed. When you're talking about baptism, you cannot separate it from the concept of a transformation that takes place as a result of uh, that baptism, and that baptism also being a symbol of that transformation. So we have two major elements when it comes to baptism, whatever kind of baptism you want to talk about. There is the issue of being immersed, and there is the issue of transformation. 
And today we're going to add a third element which I will do at the end of this teaching as we explore the nature of baptism and the different baptisms that the Bible talks about. And today we're talking, like I said earlier on, about being baptized into the death of Jesus Christ. We've been, we're called to water baptism and we're also called to baptism into Christ's death and Christ's suffering. And the first thing that we need to understand about this passage is that Paul paints the picture that grace must always be the backdrop of the understanding of the gospel. He's talking about baptism, he's talking about righteousness and dying to self, but the context of it is grace. And he's very clear about this grace, that where sin increases, grace increases all the more. And it's because of grace that we can overcome sin. It's because of grace that we can be transformed to whom God wants us to be. And uh, he actually says, talks about grace in such a manner to suggest that grace is so profound that it actually sounds scandalous. To the point where he says, does this mean we should go on sinning because of grace? Because you see, Grace essentially means receiving God's mercy, favor, and righteousness because of what Christ has done. Nothing to do with what you have done. And uh, again, he explains this when he says that sin came into the world through one man. And again, grace means that righteousness comes through the obedience of one man. That's how righteousness comes in. Just like sin entered and dominated us because of one man's disobedience, and that's Adam. And we were all considered sinners. Everyone born of a woman, born from Adam, which means every single human being before salvation through Christ is considered a sinner. Uh, no matter how good you think you are, you've never murdered, you've never raped, you've uh, never swindled anyone. Um, even you, perhaps you've, been, you've grown up in the church, but if you have not received the grace of God through receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, simply because you come from Adam, you are considered a sinner. Because one man painted all humanity. And in the similar sense, grace also says that the obedience of one man, and that's Jesus Christ, opened the door for righteousness for many. Now, we're not automatically considered uh, righteous, like we're considered sinners because we're connected to Adam. We are considered righteous when we connect with Christ, the second Adam. Our connection with the first Adam makes us automatically sinners. Our connection with the second Adam, Jesus Christ, makes us automatically righteous. And Paul says it sounds scandalous to the point where people think, oh, so is it okay that I sin simply because I'm connected with Christ? And Paul says, by no means. When you are connected with Christ, it implies that there is a death that has taken place and that there is a transforming grace in you that moves you away from the lifestyle and the dominance of sin, which I'll explain a little further as we carry on. And because grace is a result of the obedience of one man, it means that firstly, there's no room for boasting. You cannot boast um, of how you pray or how you are able to teach the word or how you walk closely with God or how you hear the voice of God. There's nothing you can boast about because all those things that God gives you, he doesn't give you because of your personal goodness. He gives you because of the goodness of Christ and because he sees Christ in you and Christ having vicariously died for us on the cross. He paid the price. For us to receive God's blessing, God's mercy. So we receive those things, not because of our performance, saint. Even though when grace is in your life, your behavior will definitely change. If it doesn't change, then something's wrong. There will be changes, but those things are a byproduct. They're not a means to get God's blessing. Your level of prayer, uh, your, your level of holiness, your level of ministry unto the Lord, the way you sing, you worship, the amount of time you spend reading the word is not a means to God's blessing. That's wrong thinking. It is a byproduct of God's grace. So yes, it is important to manifest God's character through the way we study the word, we pray, we relate to other people, walk in forgiveness and we give and so forth. But those things, saints, are not a means of accessing God's blessing because the only means is Jesus. But those things are a byproduct of that grace. It changes us, you see. So grace has a changing power, and therefore there is no, you have no room for boasting. If you are a Christian, you cannot boast, because every good thing that you have is because of Jesus Christ, and it's a byproduct of that relationship. It also means that there is no room for condemnation. You see, the enemy is very clever, and he wants to use the weapon of self-condemnation or condemnation against believers. You may, you may still make a mistake. Of course, when you receive Christ, there is a transforming grace. You begin to drift away decidedly uh, 
from a life of sin. Your mind, the way you think, begins to change as you embrace the gospel and meditate on the word. But inevitably you will make mistakes and you will stumble and fall, whether it's to do with lust or it's to do with anger or whatever it is. And when you make that mistake, the Bible tells us you go back to the Lord, you repent and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness and he will make you new. And it's done. But if you find that you constantly keep struggling and you keep beating on yourself because of that sin and you say, how could I have done that? And for weeks you dissipate and then it takes you a while to get back to understanding what God has done for you and to serving him and worshiping him with gusto. Then it means you've not understood the gospel. If you're busy condemning yourself, you're actually spurning grace and you're making it about you when it's about Jesus. Yes, when we make a mistake, we don't gloss over it. We take it to the Lord. We acknowledge it to saints we are accountable to and we lift it up to the Lord and we ask him to continue transforming us and he does it. But don't keep dwelling on your past sin. If you do that, that doesn't mean you're very righteous and humble. It actually means that you are not understanding the gospel and you're perverting God's, God's grace and you are looking down upon God's transforming grace. We must not abide in condemnation. So the fact that we've received grace means two things. There's no room for boasting and there's also, there's also no room for condemnation because grace saints, what Jesus has done is the context. Our good works are ultimately a byproduct and a fruit, not a means of accessing God's goodness. Now I want to talk more about what it means when it says we are baptized into his death. And before we get into that, there's two types of death that the Bible talks about here. There is the natural death, which happens to everyone who is not a believer. In fact, God considers you dead to him if you have not received Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means you have no access. You have no relationship with God. You cannot access his grace and his peace. You cannot access his mercy. And when you, you die physically, you will not enter eternity with God, but you will be judged. And you will have, you'll be condemned and you'll go to hell and you will go to a place of pain and sorrow and where there's no redemption, where there's no presence of God and there's no second chance. And it is nasty, saint, to die without Jesus Christ in your heart. And that is the first kind of death which we need to shun and flee from. But to shun that terrible type of death, we have to choose another kind of death. Because you see, ultimately you have to choose one kind of death. Uh, there is no two ways about it. If you fail to choose the right kind of death, you're going to have the other kind of death. And that kind of death we choose is the second death, the, the, the other death we're talking about here, which is the baptism into Christ's death. When we identify with Jesus and we allow Jesus to rule in our lives to the point where we die to the old self and we choose to live for Christ and not ourselves. The way we think, the way we talk, uh, how we use our finances, how we relate to people, how we worship. Our standard for investigating and understanding the world becomes Christ, becomes the gospel. And we shun everything else. In essence, we die to the world and we begin to live for Christ. So those two things happen simultaneously. You cannot live for Christ before you die for him and die to yourself. So that is the other death. When you choose to die for Christ, you escape the other death, which is the death of destruction and eternal separation from God and facing judgment. And that means, saints, when you are identifying with Christ and you are baptized into his death, you are saying that Christ's death to the things of the world and myself are inseparable. So in other words, you view yourself as part and parcel of every aspect of Jesus Christ, his life, his holiness, his death on the cross, his obedience to the Father, and therefore also his resurrection and eternity with him. Because Christ did not experience resurrection before he died. He had to die first. And the same thing with us saints. We cannot experience the, the power of God's goodness, grace, joy, and peace until we choose to die to ourselves and to this world and to that worldly way of thinking and approaching things. Uh, corruption, greed, selfishness, and dying to that and saying, look, I'm not going to follow that. The temptation will continue to arise, but dying to it means you choose not to be led by those things. As the Bible said, the one who is baptized into the death of Christ is done with sin. When you die, you cannot, be you cannot tempt a corpse to steal. You cannot tempt 
a corpse um, to hate. You cannot tempt a corpse uh, to fornicate. A corpse cannot do those things. And Paul is saying the same thing. When you choose to say, okay, like Christ died, I'm also going to die to this world, though I'm still living. Sin cannot rule you anymore. Ultimately, you'll be able to conquer sin. And that is the work of grace, saints. Grace can work in us so deeply that temptation and sin no longer rule us. We'll still live in a corrupt world, but that corrupt world cannot control you. Anger cannot control you. Rage cannot control you. Lust cannot control you. When you can count yourself as dead to the world, but alive in Jesus Christ. And it is Jesus who does this in you. And saints, this will give you a, a, a victory. It reminds me of a, a story I heard of a certain missionary by the name uh, Jim Elliot. And uh, this man was a missionary uh, to a group of people known then as the Orca Indians on a particular island. He was an American. And in 1956, he was martyred for his faith as he was trying to uh, reach these people for the Lord. They had no idea who Jesus was. And uh, they had been making inroads, but one time they had a misunderstanding uh, as they were trying to preach the gospel, and they were, he was martyred with his friends in 1956. But the interesting thing is someone pulled out his journal. I think it might have been at his funeral. And there was a journal entry from 1949, so that was seven years uh, before he got martyred. Because, you see, people were looking at his life and how he had died as a young missionary. Um, his wife was still young, and I think he had a child who was still very young. And uh, so it looked like a waste. And many people were saying to themselves, what a waste. He could have done more for the Lord. He could have lived longer. He could have taken care of his family and so forth. But when they pulled out the, this, this journal and they read this entry from 1949, there was something, uh, quite a striking statement that this man had written and he said in this statement he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep or loses what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose he gave his life which he could not keep anyway to gain eternity which he could never lose and saints, this was the understanding he had. And he knew, we could presumably, that it could cost him his life. And to him, he was telling the people there who were going to read that, look, it's not a loss. It's not a waste because I've given my life, which was going to end anyway, perhaps a few decades later, but it was going to end. But I willingly gave it, I invested that life such that for eternity I'm sorted. And saying, so when you die to self and you miss out on the things of the world, so to speak, whether it's a promiscuous lifestyle, so it's swindling people and it's fame and it's being a people pleaser, and you seem to be missing out, but you're actually investing in eternity. Because what you gain when judgment day comes and what you gain even on this side of eternity, the assurance, the peace, the accompaniment of the Holy Spirit is worth much more than the things you seemingly are losing. Because you're going to lose them anyway, even if you try to hold on to man's affirmation, to hold on to money on earth, to hold on to uh, people and all these. You're going to lose them anyway. You might as well invest that in eternity. And how do you do it? By choosing to live for God and to shun those things and look for God's acknowledgement and God's blessing. And that means, saints, dying to self is saying that we are choosing to be enmeshed, to be intermingled inseparably with Christ, the way he thinks, the way he lives, and his purpose for our lives. And that brings in the third dimension of the definition of baptism. It is an irreversible intermingling with Jesus Christ. For instance, one of the, the, the ways in which the term baptizo was used originally was when someone would put a, a bucket of water in a well and draw water out. So that bucket would go right in to that well and bring water from that well out. And again, that was considered baptizo. So it is an intermingling where you go into Christ and Christ gets into you like that water would get into that bucket. And those are the three levels of definition. The first one is when you enter Christ and you get baptized. That's the first level. You give yourself to the Lord. But the second level is 
Christ enters you. You allow, you open your heart and you say, Lord, change me, challenge me, lead me. And the third aspect is what happens is transfer, unavoidable transformation. And those are the three aspects, saints, that we've talked about so far when it comes to uh, baptism. The concept of baptism, whether it's baptism into, into the name of Jesus, which is water baptism, which is uh, done through water baptism, or baptism into his death. There are three things that happen. The first thing is you enter Christ, Christ enters you, and transformation automatically takes place. And that means, saints, that we are no longer under the power of sin. A baptism is such a wonderful, wonderful, powerful thing, starting with water baptism. And this is a command for every believer. Jesus said, repent and be baptized. Be baptized into the name, be water baptized, be baptized into his death, identification with him and Christ coming in you and living in you. And we're no longer dominated by sin. And Paul tells us how we can live this victorious life through grace. He says, you became slaves to righteousness through the form of teaching that you heard. So how do we activate that grace, saints, to overcome sin, to overcome lust, and all these things? It says through the teaching. And what's that teaching? It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Understanding who Jesus is and believing it, that he came on earth. It's God who became, who came and wore flesh, born of a virgin, uh, lived 33 sinless years on earth, suffered, he was beaten for us, he died on the cross for our sins, he rose again on the third day. He is going to be the ultimate judge appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. He is coming back to do this. And you believe that. And he is giving us his Holy Spirit. He is the one who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. And he guides us daily through the Spirit of God and through his truth, which doesn't change. And when you hold on to the essence of the gospel, the grace of God is activated for you. Because you see, saints, grace is more than knowing that we are forgiven because of what Christ has done. Yes, that is an aspect of grace. Grace is more than knowing that there is no, nothing you can do to earn God's favor and goodness. But it also doesn't mean that you then live as the devil. You confess Jesus Christ, say the sinner's prayer, and then you live like the devil. Then you say, oh, I've got secured my ticket to heaven. That means you haven't appropriated grace. Because when you receive true grace, your thinking, your desire, you do not desire to sin. You, there is fruit that's there. Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. There is fruit. When you're truly saved, you cannot claim to have been saved 10 years ago and you're still living in sin just as much or you've become even more sinful than you were 10 years ago. I would venture to say that you're actually, you never got saved because if Jesus had entered you, certain changes would begin to take place. Yes, you make a choice, but Jesus empowers you to change and that's grace. It is the power to live as Jesus would want you to live. It is the power to fulfill your destiny and to do things you wouldn't be able to do in your own strength because grace has a transformative there is a passive aspect to grace, which is the forgiveness for all men available. And there's an active aspect where you embrace the cross and you choose to die to self. And he gives you the power to do it. And you're no longer dominated, dear saint, by sin. So I pray that this has been a meaningful message, dear saint. We're talking about repent and be baptized, the roots of the gospel. Jesus commanded us. Jesus also went through the ordinance of baptism. And if he commanded it and he fulfilled it, what more for us as believers? We have to be baptized into the name of Jesus, which is water baptism, and baptized into his death. And that means we, receive, we get into Jesus Christ. Jesus get in, he gets into us and we are automatically transformed. So if you haven't been baptized into the name of Jesus, and I'm talking about water baptism, you can uh, get that on the first teaching. We have to do it the way the Bible instructed us as a matter of obedience, then you need to do that. And then if you haven't been baptized into his death and you've been living as you want, even though you claim to be a Christian, then you need to choose today to also plunge into the death and suffering of Jesus Christ, live for him, and you'll also be raised with him. And you'll experience his power today and more importantly, in eternity. Bless you, dear saints, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.